this morning we read, without a doubt, the most famous Christmas story and no doubt the story that many of us know. And so take your Bibles with me today in Luke chapter 2 and I'm going to read through the first 14 verses this morning. Luke chapter 2, I'm going to read out of the NLT. You can follow along in your Bible. We'll have it up on the screen. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, you know the story. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him in snugly, or wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news, good tidings that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in heaven or in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you once again for the privilege that we have to meet together and worship together. And Father, we've been able to do a lot today, sing a lot and fellowship and I see a little precious one follow you in believer's baptism and Lord, so many different things. But as we open up your word this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would enlighten us afresh and anew with a familiar passage. Lord, help us not just to click it off because it's a passage with which we're very familiar, but Lord, I pray that you would teach us afresh and anew, remind us, encourage us today. Help us to realize that you are so, or that we are so very important to you. And help us to see today the very best news that has ever been given from this passage, and we promise to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Without a doubt of the, of the four gospel narratives, Luke's version of the nativity is the most well-known and most widely read. As a matter of fact, if you're going to wake up on Christmas morning, as I encourage you to do, and grab your Bibles and read through the Christmas story with your family, most of us are going to read through the account in Luke chapter 2. Recognized for his detailed precision as an accurate historian, and we've already talked about that, and we've laid the foundation for that. But here in Luke chapter 2, Luke paints a clear picture of the events surrounding the Lord's birth. And we've talked in recent week, uh, weeks of the investigation that Luke did and the interviews, that, the interviews that Luke conducted so that he might have the most precise information, the most precise details. So here Luke speaks with specificity and Luke tells us everything that we need to know about Christ's birth. Notice a couple of things that I wrote in my notes that are significant this morning. The first is this. It's important for us to realize that Christ's birth was perfectly prearranged. Let me say that again. His birth was perfectly prearranged. Is my microphone popping still? 
Is it still popping? That's not my voice. I don't know whether there's a handheld around here somewhere. Mark, could you get me a handheld that I can use? Um, As you well know, and as the Bible clearly teaches, Christ's birth was no mere coincidence. It wasn't just that Jesus was one of the children that was born in Bethlehem, and it was just a happenstance. It was just a coincidence, something that took place. That simply is not the case. That simply is not the case. God divinely orchestrated the events so that Jesus would be born at the exact time, so that Jesus would be born in the exact location that had been previously prophesied. As a matter of fact, as we study Luke chapter 2, there are, there are so many doctrinal truths that leap out from this page. But one of the most significant, one of the most powerful is what we would define as the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God simply being that God is, is omnisciently and God is omnipotently, omnipotently controlling each and every one of the events. So as we study Luke chapter 2, we see that God's sovereign control is demonstrated in the timing of Caesar's decree. Notice the first verses with me once again, and we've all heard them so many times, we probably have them memorized, but notice once again it says, at that time the Roman emperor Augustus, let me pause there for just a second, the Caesar Augustus mentioned in this passage was born as Gaius Octavius. Now, now, uh, when they assumed the throne, they were given the title of Caesar. And so this gentleman was born as Gaius Octavius. In the year 27 BC, the Roman Senate bestowed upon him the title of Augustus. It was at that moment that he became the Roman emperor. And Gaius Octavius, or Caesar Augustus, ruled until AD 14 and was succeeded by Tiberius, who is mentioned in the next chapter, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 1. Well, evidently, at some point during his reign, he issued a decree that a a registration or a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. Notice verse 1 once again. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken. Let me pause there for just a second and just say, okay, what was the purpose of the census? It wasn't just to find out how many people were living in the land. Sometimes the Roman, the Roman government did a census to find out how many potential soldiers were out there. It was for military purposes, but this census that was decreed by Caesar Augustus wasn't just to count the population. It wasn't just to enlarge the army, but the text says very simply that it was conducted for the sake of of taxes. If you have an older King James Version, it says this. It says the census was taken so that all the world should be taxed. Now, if you have an older version and it says all the world, that phrase all the world is hyperbolic. By that, it means that that it's a little bit exaggerated. It was talking about the Roman Empire and the idea being that Caesar issued this decree to make sure that every person in the Roman Empire was paying their taxes. Now there's a lot of debate as to uh, the date of this census and quite frankly there's not a lot of extra biblical uh, uh, evidence. Josephus dates it between the years of 6 and 7 AD. Others believe that it it, uh, it occurred earlier or that it was accomplished in two different parts. Obviously, we take what the Bible says and we believe exactly what Scripture says. But here's the point. The point being that the timing of the census and Christ's birth perfectly demonstrate the sovereign control of God. And we'll see that in just a moment. You say, Brian, I I don't get it. What do you mean it's about the sovereign control of God? Well, you'll see as a result of this census being taken, Joseph and Mary had to travel somewhere. As a matter of fact, they had to travel to the exact place that the prophets had said that Jesus would be born. Here's the meaning. If the census had not occurred... Joseph and Mary would not have traveled to Bethlehem and thus Jesus would have been born in the city of Nazareth and not in the city of Bethlehem. Here's what the passage teaches us this morning. 
God is in control. God guides the hearts, the minds, and yes, the edicts of kings and presidents. Listen, I want you to catch this this morning because this is so important to us. We get it in the Christmas story, but somehow it's difficult for us to comprehend. It's difficult for us to take that message and transcend it into modern day language. But here is simply what the Bible is saying. Nothing happens outside the realm of God's sovereignty. Did you catch that this morning? Nothing happens outside the realm of God's sovereignty. I've said it before. One of the words that has never come out of God's mouth is this. Oops. How did that happen? All right. God God is never caught off guard. He's not caught off guard by what Caesar Augustus does, and he's not caught off guard by what President Obama does. God is in control. And we see that here in Luke chapter 2. We see the sovereignty of God displayed. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1 says this, The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. So as we look at this passage this morning, we see that God's sovereign control is demonstrated by the decree that was issued by Caesar Augustus. There's a second thing that we see, and I've alluded to it this morning. God's sovereign control is demonstrated by Joseph and Mary's return to Bethlehem. You see, as the passage indicates, to accomplish this census, each family was required to return to their ancestral town. Actually, the ancestral town of the husband. Let's just stop for a moment and say, okay, let's imagine that this decree was issued in the United States and the census was going to be taken and you had to return, gentlemen, you had to return to the city of your birth. I'd venture to say that the great majority of us here today are not from South Florida. How many of us are from somewhere else other than South Florida today? All right, look at that. Big majority of us. And so if this census was taken here, we would be required to return to our ancestral village or our ancestral town where we were born. Vicki and I would be packing up the van and we'd be heading for Canton, Ohio. That's where I was born And no doubt you would be going somewhere else as well. So since Joseph was from the house of David, this registration necessitated that he and Mary, catch this, make the 90-mile trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And you might sit back and say, no big deal, 90 miles, that's like from here to Naples. All right, we can make that just shoot right across the Alligator Alley. We can make that in just a couple of hours, no problem. All right, let's put ourselves not in our context today, but let's put ourselves in the New Testament context. context. And, and remember that Joseph and Mary lived in a time where there were no planes, there were no trains, there were no automobiles. That sounds like a Christmas movie, doesn't it? Planes, trains, and automobiles. Uh, there, uh, there was nothing during that time. They had to walk. They had to ride an animal. And the trip was an uphill trip. And Mary was some eight months pregnant. So I sit and read that. I think about how arduous a trip that would have been. So I mentioned there was no forms of public transportation. Mary most likely rode on the back of a donkey. I cannot believe that we can even begin to imagine how difficult that trip was for Joseph and for Mary. And yet, God allowed that to happen. You see, as we look at this passage, we see that with detailed precision, Luke shows us how this census fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. I'd remind you that it was Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Many of you are familiar with this verse, Micah 5, 2, that simply states, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from a distant Past. Micah was written some 600 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. 
And so Luke, remember Luke's job is to try to convince Theophilus as to the veracity of the story of Jesus. And so Luke, with detailed precision, talks about the trip and the necessity that Joseph and Mary had to return to Bethlehem, thus fulfilling the prophecy that was given by Micah so many years ago. What does that show us? It shows us that Christ's birth was prearranged. It was planned. It was handled with detailed precision. Uh, one of our missionaries, uh, you've met him before, is uh, it's a man by the name of Claudio Jimenez. Claudio and I served together in Mexico City, and now Claudio is starting a church in Buenos Aires, Argentina. His church is celebrating its 10th anniversary in just a few months, and we're hoping to take some of our folks down there. But when Claudio and I worked together, Claudio was the detail guy, because I'm not the real detail guy. He was the detail guy, and I was kind of the vision guy. And so I'd cast the vision, and it was Claudio's job to get it done, and I was always asking him, Claudio, where where are we in the process? And he would always look at me and he would give me this phrase in Spanish. He'd say, Brian, no te preocupes, don't worry. Todo está fríamente calculado. Everything is coldly calculated. And to Claudio's credit, it always happened just as he said it was going to happen. Well, as we look at the prophecies of Micah and Isaiah, and we see them fulfilled here in Luke chapter 2, we can see that God's plan to save the world was friamente calculado. It was coldly calculated. God knew everything that was going to take place. It was prearranged. We see a second thing in the passage, a second aspect that you're very familiar with. Christ's birth, secondly, was humbly accomplished. Quite possibly, verse 7 is the most recognized verse in regards to Christ's birth. Let me read verse 7 again, although you are, you are very familiar with it. It says, she gave birth to her first son, her first child, a son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes or in snuggly or snuggly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Notice three simple facts as I, as I read through this that I'm reminded of. Number one, Jesus was given humble accommodations. Now, as you and I have read this story and we've watched Christmas plays and many of us have watched children's plays, obviously often the bad guy in the story is the innkeeper. And we always paint the innkeeper as the bad guy. I have a sneaking suspicion that the innkeeper got a bad rap. We always picture this crude innkeeper coldly turning away a pregnant woman. Who in their right mind would do that? But most likely that's not the way that the events took place. You see, the inn that's mentioned here in Luke chapter 2 was probably what was called a caravansary. It was a rough overnight lodging for caravans. Many caravans traveled, groups of people would travel together through that, uh, through that countryside during that time, and those groups of people would look for a place to stay, and obviously now everybody in the country was up in arms, and everybody was traveling, so you, can you imagine how busy the inns, the caravansaries were? The, these were not hotels that would have luxur luxurious rooms like you and I are used to. They would have been just a large open area where weary travelers would have settled down for just a few hours rest. More than likely, Joseph was looking out for his wife who by now was probably in labor and say, so, you know what, I don't want to put her in the midst of a whole bunch of people in a crowded courtyard. Is there a private place? Is there some place where we can be alone? I know it might not be in the end. There might not be room there. Is there some place where we can have some sense of privacy? And so he chose a neighboring stable where only the animals would have heard the painful cries of a mother giving birth. Many, many believe that that stable was, uh, was a, a cave, a small cave, and 
the mountainside there on the hills of Bethlehem. As a matter of fact, if you travel to Bethlehem today, you will be directed to a small cave in the underground section of a large cathedral that is considered the traditional place of Christ's birth. You see, Jesus arrived to humble accommodations. He, uh, he was laid in a humble bed. No high-tech birthing room, no medical personnel, no, no sterile incubator in which to put the newborn child. With no other place to lay the baby, he was placed in an animal feeding trough. So many of us have seen pictures. We've tried our best to build one up here this year. The manger was a rough trough made of stone or wood, sometimes out of certain types of metal, but basically out of stone or wood. It's interesting to me as I've read through this passage over and over again this week, how many times the manger is used in Luke chapter 2. As a matter of fact, it's used three different times. It's found in verse 6, it's mentioned in verse 12, And it's mentioned in verse 16. It's N.T. Wright that said this, speaking about the significance of the manger. He said the manger was a signpost pointing the shepherds to the person and to the purpose of Jesus. As a matter of fact, three times it says, and here's the sign, you will find the baby lying in a manger. What was that? That was, that was directions. That was indications as to where they would find the baby. But it not only demonstrated where Jesus would be born, but it demonstrated the person and the purpose of Jesus. He was laid in a humble bed. The text says that he wore humble clothes. The Bible descriptively says that he was wrapped in, if you have an older version, it says that he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. The reference is the fact that that he would have been tightly wrapped with strips of cloth. Our version says she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger. You say, Brian, what in the world was the purpose of those swaddling clothes, those snugly strips of cloth? Well, there were two purposes. You know the first one. The first one was to keep him warm. All right. As the baby was born, I mean, any, any baby needs blankets around him or, or something to keep him warm. But there was a second purpose. The second purpose was to keep the baby straight. You see, medical thought and medical practice was so much different during New Testament times than it was today. But normal, normal child care of that time thought that it was extremely important to keep the limbs straight. So those limbs, the arms, and the legs were tightly wrapped to keep them in a rigid position. So here's Jesus. As Mark said just a few moments ago, King of kings, Lord of lords, left the splendors of heaven. Angels all around him shouting, Holy, holy, holy. Left the beauty and the splendors of heaven. And all of a sudden he shows up in this cave, in this animal stable, and he's placed in an animal feeding trough with these straps of cloth tightly wrapped around him. What does it demonstrate for us? It demonstrates the humility of Jesus' birth. It was humbly accomplished. I love that song that Mark sings because If you think about it, all of us would have those questions. Why wouldn't Jesus have come to the palace? Why wouldn't Jesus have come to the capital? Why would not Jesus have been born to the royal family? Why not? And what a beautiful demonstration of the compassion and the humility of God that he chose to be born in such a humble way. Let me show you a third thing. The third thing is this. Christ's birth was angelically announced. As we we come to verse 
8, there is a scene change. The setting shifts from the animal stable to the hillside surrounding the city of Bethlehem. And now the focus is placed upon the shepherds who, oblivious to the night's dramatic events, were in their fields tending their flocks. Well, it's important, or it's important for us this morning to not romanticize the occupation of shepherds. During New Testament times in general, they were dishonest, they were unclean according to the standards of the law. The shepherds generally represented the outcasts of society. How fitting then that they were the very first ones invited to this party celebrating Jesus' incarnation. I paused there as I was as I was reading and, th- and praying through the passage, and I wrote this down. I believe this is in your notes. The announcement given to the shepherds demonstrates God's desire for all men to hear. It represents God's desire for all men to hear because if you would have been tasked with formulating a list of those who would receive the news of Jesus' birth, I guarantee you that the, that the people on the top of the list would not have been the shepherds. As a matter of fact, you and I would have said, well, man, we got to tell the mayor of Bethlehem. Most certainly, that's who we have to tell and, and why there are some very important distinguished families in Bethlehem and why they should know. And, and man, the religious leaders should know. As a matter of fact, someone would have had to remind you, why, what about the shepherds? And your first thought probably would have been, well, you know what, I'm not too concerned about telling the shepherds they're not going to care anyways. Why, they are just the outcasts of society. Yet I find it interesting that those shepherds were the very first recipients of the message of the gospel. Is that significant to you? Because it's significant to me and it demonstrates to me the fact that God wants everyone to hear the message. It doesn't matter what their station in society is. It doesn't matter what their class is. Why the message of the gospel is for everyone. And this morning, if it's for the shepherds, you can be assured of the fact that the message of the gospel is for you, and it's for me as well. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13, For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And, and I'm so glad that God didn't reach out just to the religious right, or just reach out to uh, you know the, the most perfect people in our society or in any society, God reaches out to absolutely everyone. Well, the text says that the heavens were immediately filled with a heavenly host. I love how the New Living Translation says, it says, the armies of heaven. The Message Bible defines it this way, the angelic choir. And you'll notice, we won't take the time to look at it today, but there's a parallelism contrasting the human with the divine. It says, glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill to men. So there in the fields of Bethlehem, those shepherds probably listened to one of the most beautiful concerts that has ever been given. What a beautiful concert that must have been. I know that some of you have enjoyed concerts by the Gaithers or Casting Crowns or, or Skillet, but, but, but whatever, those concerts cannot even begin to compare with the music that the shepherds heard that night. It's, it's simplified. It's said in such a succinct way, God was glorified and praised for the birth of His Son. Here's the point that I wrote down. The point that I wrote down is this. The concert given by the heavenly choir demonstrates God's desire for all men to worship Him. Let me say that again. That, that, that concert given by the heavenly choir demonstrates God's desire for everyone to worship Him. I know in the announcements we talked about Vernita's holding tryouts in just a few weeks for our worship team. And man, there are some of you that sing really well, 
that we want on our worship team. If you sing well and you're not a part of the worship team, we want you on that worship team. But quite frankly, if you don't sing well, we don't want you on the worship team. All right? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't praise God because it doesn't matter whether you have a good voice or whether you don't have a good voice. You were created to worship God. And God's desire is for you and me to worship Him. I love the quote by John Piper. John Piper says this, speaking about missions. He says, missions exists because worship doesn't. And the idea is this, that we send missionaries all around the world. Why? Because God desires for every man, woman, and child to worship Him. Did you ever sit back and ask the question, I wonder what God's will for my life is. I wonder what God wants me to do. I wonder what God wants me to be. Here's what God wants you to be, and here's what God wants you to do. God wants you to be a worshiper. And God wants you to worship Him. You see, the angelic choir demonstrates the fact that God wants every single person to worship Him. Let me ask you this morning, do you worship? You might say, Brian, you know what? I'm so fearful of singing out. I don't want to sing out because I'm afraid that I'll turn people off. I'm afraid that people will hear my voice. Listen, it's not about singing in public. It's not about singing loud. It's about the state, the condition of your heart. Have you learned to worship God? He is the only one that is worthy of our worship. Let me show you the fourth thing as we pull this to a close today. Christ's birth, fourthly, was purposefully planned. Today we conclude by asking the question that was given by that great theologian, Charlie Brown. When Charlie Brown said this, what is the real meaning of Christmas? And Charlie Brown asked that question. Well, in today's passage, the angel clearly responds to that question. He clearly articulates the real meaning of Christmas in such a way that there is no doubt as to the significance of our most loved holiday. And the angel uses three phrases. Let me show you these three phrases, and we'll be done today. The first phrase is this. It's the phrase, good news. The phrase good news for, listen, the the angel said, I bring you good news. I bring you good tidings of great joy. The news which the angel shared and the choir sang about that evening was more than just an interesting novel. It was more than just the news that was on the front page of the Bethlehem Times. It was truly good news for all mankind. It was the gospel, the word that that is used here in the passage is evangelion, which is the news for the gospel, the good news that God had provided a way of salvation for all mankind. Let me remind you that for 400 years, God had been silent. For 400 years, God's people had questioned, where is God? Has He forgotten about us? Is the Messiah coming? When all of a sudden, on a Judean hillside, the angels cry out, we bring you good news. The best news. The Messiah is born. So this morning, for each and every one of us, the best news that we have ever received is not that Vicki said yes, even though that was a, a great day for me. It's not that you got a job. It's not that you're expecting your first child. Those are all wonderful things to hear about. But the best news is simply this. Jesus loves you. The fact that God loves you so much that He sent Jesus Christ to earth. The second phrase that I use is the word Savior. He says in the passage that unto you is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The term Savior demonstrates the fact that Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. I find that amazing. The angel could have used so many descriptive titles that night. He could have said, why there is a friend that has come. Why there is an example that has come. 
Why, there is a ruler that has come, and each of those titles would have been correct. But those were not the titles which clearly delineated his purpose. The angel announced the arrival of a Savior, one who had come to seek and to save those that needed him. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, Jesus said it this way, For the Son of Man come to seek and to save those who are lost. Aren't you glad for the fact that God seeks us and seeks us until he finds us? If you're here today and you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, God is searching for you. And God desires to have a personal relationship with you. There's a third phrase that's given. And it's the, th- it's the phrase, peace on earth. Verse 14, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Here, here's the idea. Real peace, lasting peace, true peace only comes through Jesus Christ. It's at this time that many express their desire for peace on earth. No doubt this is a time when many lay aside their differences and demonstrate peace. And by the way, I hope you do that in your families as well. Tomorrow my blog article is going to be how to, how to experience peace in your family get-togethers. How to not fight at family get-togethers during Christmas. And so I trust that you experience that peace during the holidays. It was C.S. Lewis that stated this, to armies, Christmas is a ceasefire agreement. Some people feel that Christmas, that the Christmas spirit is a truce that takes place in a family where nobody quarrels. To many, it is expressed in a card that conveys a sentiment of well-being. But Jesus didn't come just to bring peace on earth. He came to bring peace with God something that can only be experienced when you and I open our hearts and invite him to be a part of our lives. Jesus said this in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. My um, favorite Christmas story I think I've told it before, but it is so good I want to tell it again and we'll be done. It's about a seventh grade boy by the name of William Sperling. Not sure whether you've heard this story before. William Sperling was big for his age and a little slow mentally, but, but William was a good boy and all the kids liked him. When it, when it came time for the Christmas program in William's school, William wanted to be the shepherd, but But the teacher decided that William would be a better innkeeper than he would a shepherd since he was so big. And so she gave him the task of being the rough innkeeper. Well, when Mary and Joseph came to the inn and knocked on the door, it was William Sperling that opened the door. And when they asked for a place to stay, it was William Sperling that harshly said, There is no place for you to stay in the inn. There's no room in the inn. Joseph said, but my, t- my, but my wife is tired and weary. She is expecting a baby. Isn't there just a small room? Isn't there just somewhere would, where, where we could rest? Once again, William Spurring said with roughness as his voice as he was taught to do, you'll have to find somewhere else. There's no room in the inn. Once more, Joseph pleaded, pleaded for just some place for them to stay during the night. Then there was a long pause. One of those pauses that is as embarrassing for the audience as it is for the cast. You ever been in one of those children's plays where, where the, one of the kids are supposed to say something and they don't say something. Everybody's on the edge of their seat waiting to see what, what the next word that the child is going to say. That's what was happening in this school play because William Sperling had forgotten his next line. And so back behind the prompts, you could hear the prompter yelling out William's words, No, be gone! No, be gone! That was his next speech. Finally, William Sperling said with softness in his voice, No, be gone. Mary and Joseph sadly turned to leave. But as they did, suddenly William regained his voice and said, 
Wait a minute. He jumped outside the lines. Wait a minute. You can sleep in my room. And I'll sleep in the shed. In the stunned silence that followed, the teacher thought that the play was run. Until she thought once again of the words of that seventh grade boy who may have communicated the real truth of Christmas better than any. Now, Jesus, you can stay in my room. I'll sleep in the shed. Now, now, now think with me. There's so many applications for that. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? No, you don't have to die in your sins. I'll take your place. You don't have to spend eternity separated from me. You can enter into my heavenly home. I'm preparing a place for you. You see, it's Christmas that makes all the difference in the world. And the best news that you and I will receive today, tomorrow, Christmas morning, anytime, is the fact that God loved us so much that he sent Jesus Christ to the earth to take our place. That's really good news.